You're listening to Unjiggered, a bartender podcast where we interview highly successful bartenders about their careers, lives, and the passion of bartending. This week, we have our very own Michele Mariotti on the podcast. Listen to how he moved from Italy to his first job in London, working in an ice cream bar, working at both the American Bar and then the Barclay, and now ending up in Singapore. Plus, listen to why we started this podcast. With this podcast, we want to peel back the mask and discover just how the greats really became the greats. So sit back and enjoy. Hi, my name is Michele Mariotti, and I actually run this podcast. Well, Michele, welcome to your own podcast. Um, <laughs> nice you, to be here, I guess. I'm glad to have you. <laughs> you know, I think the audience of this podcast has been clamoring to hear your own story. And to be honest, I'm quite curious myself to hear it. So... Why don't we start where you come from? Let's start in uh, Udine, the capital of Friuli, in northern <laughs> Italy. Tell, tell us about a bit about your upbringing and how you first got into the restaurant and bar culture and industry. So I started uh, working in bars when I was about 15, 16. Um, where I'm from, we're very close to the um, sea. So it's very common for people like during their teens to work by the sea during summertime. So I ended up working when I was about 15, as I said as a uh, glass collector and glass polisher for a five-star hotel in the area. It was a whiskey bar open for residents alone. And I remember polishing like about 1,500 bottles of whiskey every day. I hated it to bits. <laughs> but there were a few elements of it which I really, really loved. I mean, I mean, what I really liked about it was the fact that people were coming in to have a good time. As a person, I tend to feed a lot from the energy that I get around me from other people. And I did get that in there. You know, I did get a lot of energy, especially from my colleagues. While during my studies, because I was studying uh, to work in a travel agency, you end up working in an office and then energy that people bring in on a Monday morning to work in that specific environment is very different. There's a lot of negative energy and people just come there to get their job done and then go home. And I just really, really missed the bar. And I just, that's the way I fell in love with it. Plus my first head bartender was this extremely charismatic guy who like literally would have people coming in just to see him and they would stay like a week in the hotels just so they could spend time in the bar with him and i don't know like he had such a magnetic personality and he used the bar as a stage for him to perform and i just i fell in love with it from the very beginning yeah i think that that's something that a lot of people can relate to who work in the industry i think that whole coming into work and hosting people and it's more of an experience know, right? it's, it's not that just like kind of nine to five, I'm just coming up and showing up to do my job. Um, so after that experience, what was your next step in the industry? So after that, uh, I used to work with this guy from the, so I come from the very Northeast, very close to the Austrian border. And when I was there, I worked with this guy from the center of Italy. So who came there just for the summer season and he studied hospitality, which I didn't at the time. And he said to me that, you know, one day I would like to move to London because my teacher kept talking about the Ritz Hotel. And I really would like to try to work there. And at that time, I had my first cocktail book, which was the Savoy cocktail book. And I thought, you know what? I really want to move to London. Like, I want to get to experience how people make drinks there because that sounds like it's the drink capital of, of, of Europe, right? So I must go and try that. And that's uh, that's what we did. So about age 19, uh, we left uh, Italy. We finished our studies, left Italy, went there. And then uh, I just got into London. So that was my first uh, stepping stone. My first actual job there was in an ice cream bar. Was a disaster, man. So, like, essentially, what what happened there is like, we were working like crazy. We were doing ice cream in the morning, and then during the afternoon we would serve the ice cream, and then in the evening we would have like a coffee slash restaurant thing. And the thing is that the owner of the restaurant himself thought that because I'm Italian, I absolutely know how to cook pasta, so he stuck me in the kitchen like day one. And at that stage, I'm like 19. I have never cooked for myself ever so i had no clue what i was doing i think the first portion of pasta i've ever served was about half a kilo of like pasta in a huge plate <laughs> <laughs> they always say like uh you know step one to making pasta is when it's still dry take out the pasta step two is break that in half because you only need half that uh. much when you actually <laughs> soak it so uh, i'm assuming did, did you come to london like did you have a place to live did you have the job like was that pre-arranged or did you just kind of show up uh, we kind of showed up. At the, at the time, I had a very limited amount of savings, and we just came over with whatever I had. Plus, at the time, the exchange rate was very favorable for the pound, so I literally came with no money. So for the first month or so, I left. I lived in a hostel, and the reason why I worked in an ice cream bar is because it was literally the first job I could get in order to get an income. 
which was quite, uh, you know, at the, at the beginning it's quite shocking because it was also like my first experience outside of home. So you really need to start to consider paying rent and stuff like that. And you really need a job essentially. Yeah. I think, um, you know, something when it, when it comes to taking those risks to moving from your hometown to another bigger city, maybe in your native country or moving to another country mm. like you did, like, I think a lot of people get hung up on like, oh, how do you do this? How do you do it? But you just kind of got to do it. You know, like there's yeah. never going to be a safe plan for it. I, I agree with you. And I think a lot of things in life, you just you just have to do it. Like, you know, like I can relate to my first cocktail competition. You know, you always think, am I ready? Am I not ready? But then if you just don't do it, you never know where is it that you need to prepare and what is it that you need to do and what is it that you're good at and what is it that you're not good at. I think you just need to go for it. Can you tell us about your first cocktail competition? So my very first cocktail competition, I think was in, uh, I can't remember the year exactly, but I remember it was Simone Caporale's first cocktail competition as well. First or second or something oh, you're like that. dating yourself here. Huh? I know, right? <laughs> it, it was a UKBG thing and it, it thoroughly kicked my ass. And uh, I remember like being mega stressed. Like I severely underestimated what is it that they needed to do in order to compete and uh, that was quite cool yeah it was like so ukbg used to be quite big in the uk now it's picking up some steam again but it kind of lost momentum when brands started to organize cocktail competitions i think simply because they had bigger budgets so they could do better things right and uh, essentially yes we had this competition with them we had to make a twist on a Martinez and a actual Martinez. And I remember I went there thinking, okay, I've got this, no problem, you know. And then I, I showed up there and I was like number 15 going into the competition. And Simone Caporale was number three, like was the third one to go. And I see him throwing these drinks. And at that time, I've never seen anyone throwing a drink. I literally thought, I just read it on like some books that people, that was, used to be a technique. And then when I saw him doing like this beautiful, super clean throw and making this beautiful drink, I thought, man, I'm screwed. Like, there's no way I can do anything <laughs> like that. Well, I'll tell you, brother, I've been bartending for 13 years and I still can't throw a drink. So no, 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 yes. <laughs> it's good you got that experience early. <laughs> um, just since we're on the topic, before we kind of take that next step in, in your next moves in your career when you move to London, as far as cocktail competitions are concerned, have you done a lot? Like, how do you feel like it, it helped you or shaped your career? So there was a time where I was uh, doing a lot of competitions and uh, there was a time when I worked at the Savoy where we had a lot of people entering competitions and that was sort of like something that would send out a statement, right? Like if you won that specific competition and you brought it back home, it would just say like, okay, I know what I'm doing and would sort of help you develop your own profile within the bar. So that was something that somehow in a certain way was incentivized in the hotel despite the fact that we didn't really have someone telling us hey man you really need to enter this competition so we did quite a lot and um, the one that i liked the most was actually work class so we d i did work class about three times again the first time i did work class i was competing against simone caporale who again thoroughly kicked my ass but then i think this third time i got into the uk final which was quite cool which was like four days in scotland we went there to make a series of different challenges. Some of them were based on foraging. Some other were based on like food pairing. It was just such an amazing experience. And I cannot recommend it enough. Like I think that cocktail competitions are made for you to improve and learn a lot about what you do. And then sometimes you win them, sometimes you lose them. As a matter of fact, the vast majority of times you will lose a cocktail competition. There will be someone who will win it like ahead of you. It's just the fact that you develop such tight bonds with the people that you go and compete against that it's something that will stay with you for the rest of your life. You know, I'm still in touch with people that I competed with. For instance, Tim Laferla, I competed with him against in this very competition I was talking about. And I just went to have a guest shift at this bar, a scout in Sydney, like four years later, you know, and we're still like very good mates, you know, we can still go out for a drink and we still have things to talk about. And it's an amazing experience. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think you're really touching on what's super important about that or any travels or any opportunities you get with the industry. It really is about the bonds and the relationships you make with people. And, you know, obviously when you see failure, you get an opportunity to experience failure and to grow from it and to learn from it. And that, that's awesome that, that you still have these bonds of people around the world today. Um, so going back a little bit. Yeah. So uh, you, 19 years old, a young Michele. <laughs> goes to uh, cook giant bowls of pasta and <laughs> make ice cream at ice cream shop. How how does 
How does that version of Michele make their way to American Bar? So the survival was like this sort of dream of mine since I had the book. And when I joined London was 2008, it was full financial crisis. And the Savoy was actually closed for a huge refurbishment. In fact, they reopened in 2010. And as a matter of fact, I realized that when I went into London, which is such a competitive market, that there's so much talent, like raw talent into it, I realized immediately that I was not ready to, I, I couldn't make the cut to get there. So what I, what a friend of mine actually told me, okay, Michele, you need to, I think you need to develop your skills and you need to grow into your position before you can actually apply for such a job. Therefore, I had a couple of jobs at the time around different places until I landed this job as a head bartender in a Michelin star restaurant uh, for Galvin Brothers, these two Michelin star restaurants in the UK. Very, very talented. And what I loved about it is that they had such a uh, connection with the ingredients they were using. And so I was trying to, I tried to absorb as much as that as possible. For instance, I remember like we had this apple juice on the menu and I thought, okay, this is apple juice. But then I was having a conversation with the chefs and at the time they were running an apple dessert on the menu and they were really thorough about the selection of the apples they had to have in their own apple pie in in order for them to get the flavor they wanted to achieve. So as a result, we started to develop the juices in in, in conjunction with some of our suppliers in order to get the, the fruit that we really wanted for what we needed. Because there are like a huge amount of varieties of apples out there, you know, and when you put them all in one basket and say like, okay, this is red, this is green. That's not a classification that will help you eventually get the flavor that you want. So that was very, very helpful for me. And I worked there for a couple of years until eventually, like I thought I should try and apply for the job. And eventually I did. I mean, that's great. And I think that that's cool when you we start to open those doors in your mind where you realize that like, a red apple isn't just a red apple. No, no, you know? it's not. <laughs> a green yeah, apple isn't just so, a green yeah. apple. There's so many nuances to the flavor and what you can do with it. It seems it's interesting. So, so your first, your first job really in industry in your local town during during a, a summer season of tourism was a hotel. Yes. Uh, you did your your stint at at the ice cream place, and then you were working at a two star Michelin restaurant. I, I worked also in a club before that, so there was a quick, quick, quite club, the club environment. Days. No, club days were fun, man. Were so much fun. Like working in a three deep bar with people shouting drinks at you, like because the music is super loud. It's so much fun. Like the cool thing about working in clubs is that you get this sort of control. Like you kind of get to decide who drinks what. You know what I mean? Like you've got like this three deep line and you've got your usual dude who's like mega aggressive trying to get your attention. And you and, and then you've got this very polite guy sitting on the left just looking at you and like thinking, oh, I'm very sorry I'm here. Did you see me? And you think, you know what? This aggressive dude can wait. Like, I, I don't know. You get like this sense of like immediate reward out of it. I really like it. Well, and that's crowd control, right? Yeah, indeed, and I mean, yeah. I think that's like, that's why it's important if you have the opportunity to get that well-rounded experience mm-hmm. to not only work at one type of place because, yeah, I mean, uh, working at a club or a very busy, loud, late night bar, you're going to learn how to, how to reward, to punish, how to flow, yeah, how to indeed, like yeah. control people when they're, when they're getting a little out of line. Um, it seems though that you, you you do have a little bit of a gravitation towards maybe the structure of this, either a two star Michelin restaurant or a hotel type environment. You've spent you know to date a lot of your career in hotels, so like going going to Savoy. Maybe let's talk a little bit about your experience of actually getting hired there. You have mm. this dream job, and like what was your expectations versus reality to start? So to get hired there at the beginning, like it's a huge building with a lot of bureaucracy, as you would expect from my big hotels. Therefore, you end up having to go through a very thorough interview process. So you have about four or five interviews. You meet a lot of people that you didn't even know existed in hotels. And then eventually you land the job. And to me, that experience was, it just adds like sort of momentum to it because you you apply for a job, but then the fact that you have to go through so many layers just makes it so monumental in a way. And then when you actually land it, you think, okay, this is it. You know, I'm ready for it. And I still remember receiving the email saying, Michele, would you mind coming on this day for a uniform fitting? Meaning that there is someone who will like get a uniform that is tailored to you. That's just such a unique feeling. I I love that. And then shortly after you start to work there and you start to fully appreciate the environment. Look, I think the American bar, especially when I joined, wasn't specifically like the perfect bar, 
but he had but I also think nobody's perfect but I think there is a lot of charisma and personality there I think it's such a great place and it has so much history but it does it's one of those places that doesn't necessarily live out of his history but tries to forge his own legacy with every generation of bartenders that you get there and I just found it like being such a competitive environment where every single senior bartender there really struggles to get hold of like a little bit more of extra attention or like opportunities in order for you to develop your own career, you know? So I really, really enjoyed it. I was very competitive, quite draining as an experience for like four years. A touch stressful, but the bonds that I've developed there with my teammates are, are some bonds that stayed with me to this very day. Yeah, no, I mean, definitely. I think obviously going through those type of situations with people and with the people you work with create those special bonds and you know, talking about, you know, some of the people and the personalities, you know, I, I like I went through a sim- similar experience when I joined the team at Dead Rabbit, you know, like mm-hmm. it, was, it was intimidating to yeah, bartend next to team. Jack McGarry and people like that. So, like, what was your experience like working with Eric Lorenz and, and then and you you started before Declan, right? Mm-hmm. And so, yeah. like, how did, how did things change when Declan arrived? So... Uh, to be completely honest, when I joined there, uh, I got a position as a senior bartender and I was age 22. And um, at that specific stage of my life, I was still very, very afraid of Eric. To me, Eric looked like this like picture-perfect bartender, like a god of bartending that you cannot approach and you cannot ask questions to. Uh, after a couple of years, I did manage to understand that my perception of it was completely wrong because Eric is one of the most approachable human beings you can possibly meet. And it's one of those people who gives you so much. Just you have to be willing to take it, you know? It, it's it, it's not the kind of person who's going to come and spoon feed you like knowledge or techniques or anything. But uh, when you ask, he's going to give 110% of what he has to you. So at the very beginning, I think I, I sort of missed out a little bit on on, on that. And this is one of the reasons why I've decided to start running this podcast is because at the very beginning, I found it so difficult to relate to people like Eric, being a young bartender, that I wish someone showed me that Eric is an actual human being. You know, it's not like something that it it does not exist on planet Earth. And so the reason why we, we started this is because I wanted to show to perhaps younger bartenders that a lot of the people that we consider industry legends nowadays... They are actually human beings, you know? It's people who started from the very bottom because our industry is a very humble industry. We all start from the bottom. We all polish a ton of glasses. We all do a lot of preps, a lot of hours, and we all have to read a lot and study a lot because we don't have a a specific course of studies that allow us to get into the industry well prepared. And and I just wanted to show this to younger generations, you know? I just wanted to take people who, like, perhaps are, are afraid of your Dale de Groff and your, you know... Matt Wiley or whoever you want to talk about, Ryan Chetty, and then show them that, look, this this guy, Matt Wiley, yes, is a very, very well-known bartender. He's got some groundbreaking concepts, but ultimately, he's a human being, you know? He was polishing glasses like you were. He was working his ass off. You are also working your ass off. So if you believe in it, you can achieve the same results. Yeah, I mean, what you're saying is, is very true and very important, mm-hmm. especially to you know, people who are younger and coming up in the audience uh, of the Unjiggered podcast, I mean, willing to take that moment to ask to learn. And like you just said, like how how Eric Lorenz's demeanor was with you guys is that if you would ask, he would give you everything. But you do have to like stand up and ask. And of Mm -hmm. course, it's all about integrity and saying it the right way. I know like the there, there's this great quote, uh, closed mouths don't get fed, right? So it's like you have to say something, you have to speak up, you have mm-hmm. to speak about what you want um, and take advantage of the opportunity to learn from someone like that. So, I mean, you worked at American Bar at obviously the height of its, a lot of its amazing successes. And I mean, you guys won like every award under the sun. And I remember being in the States, like looking from afar and really like admiring everything American Bar was doing. And it had this image of like every bartender at American Bar is like polished and like perfect and amazing. And like, did you feel the stress and the pressure of that when you showed up to work or did it feel more like a a job you just came into or? So I think one of the things that, the Savoy has that a lot of places don't have is the history of it, but then also the amount of raw talent. Like 
But so by history, I mean that every day when I walked to work, I had to pass by the Savoy Court, which is this very, very monumental entrance to the hotel. And then when you look back at it, you think like, you look at it and you think, well, wow, this is, this is a very cool place. And then every time you start your shift, I used to like, there's two ways you can come to the bar when you start your shift. You can come from the back or you can come from the front. I always love to come up from the front because then you just walk into the bar and you get to absorb it every day. And I remember like sometimes when I had like long, like long periods of holidays, like say you're away for like a week or so, and then you come back and then you take that way and you walk in, you see the piano, the people, and you just breathe in and you just feel it. You know, I, I think that under that specific circumstance that the bar is amazing in terms of pressure from the outside, you did have a lot of pressure from the outside, but that was sort of like a given because like being a five-star luxury hotel, you sort of like are expected to deliver on a daily basis. What I felt more was the pressure from inside rather than from outside. I had a lot of colleagues and to, to whom I, I owe a lot. And I think few people are like, a guy called Luca, Luca Corradini, is not very popular at the moment because he chose to like, live like a little bit like a hermit. But like you got people like Martin Hudak as well, or Tom Walker, for instance, who won Legacy. And the amount of sheer like passion and and like energy they fueled into their work, you know, on a daily basis, would would make you reconsider what this is that you're doing. You know, you would start on a shift on a day, thinking, okay, this week I was just very busy. I worked like from like this day to this day. I did like 12 hours a day, mega busy bar. But then meanwhile, next to you, there is a colleague that, yes, he did the same, but he's also competing in a global competition while on his two days off, he's shaking whatever drink in a festival somewhere else. And then you think like, okay, you know what? I really need to step up my game, you know? And then you start thinking, okay, I need to read more. I need to have knowledge. I need to visit distilleries. I need to visit places. I need to do guest shifts, you know? And these are all things that have to come from, from you. Like you cannot expect someone to come and spoon feed you guest shifts to go and travel somewhere. You need to put yourself in the game. You need to go out. And I think a lot of the colleagues I work with really gave me this motivation, you know? I mean, I think that's very true. And I think that's great advice in general for people out, out in the world. But of course, it's very important that you perform in what, what you are hired for and what you're doing mm -hmm. at American Bar. So I got a question for you because I'm just curious about this. What is it with Italians and bartending, man? You guys are like all over the world. Like in London, there's so many Italian bartenders who are successful. Like, do you think it comes from just like, is there like an innate hospitable aspect to Italian culture? Like, like what, what, what is that? You know, I think there are a number of factors that contribute to that. I think the very first, as you said, is something that we have within our blood. Like we love hosting people and we love, we have this sort of outgoing personality, generally speaking. In my hometown, for instance, it's like I come from a very small place. About 750 people live there. Okay. Ex extremely tiny. And everyone knew each other. But m my reality is not a unique reality. A lot of people in Italy live in small areas. Like Even if you are within a city, you've got these small pockets of people who like live in very, very tight communities. So as a result, there is this human element to it where everybody knows each other and you all talk and then you go to a bar and then a bar is seen as this place where people socialize, right? In a way, somehow similar to the US, you know, like I noticed this a lot in the US where people let's just go to the bar to meet people and talk to people, right? In uh, where I'm from, the bars are like the focal point of the community. So you've got a lot of people when they start work, they go to a bar and they have coffee and they meet their own friends, which they've grew up with. Because the place is so small, they only have so many job opportunities. They all start at the same time, they all meet in the same place. Then when they finish work, they all meet in the same place and they all chit chat, they have an aperitivo and they go home. Then they go home, then they come back and they have their own like after dinner, amaro, whatever, and they go back home. So bars are like an integral part of Italian society, you know, like people meet and spend time together in bars. So I think that's one of the key elements. I also think the second element is that for some reason, and I cannot pinpoint why, uh, a lot of countries have stigmatized the profession of, of a bartender, like as something that it's sort of something like a, a, a second class profession that you really don't want to do. However, in Italy, in Italy, somehow it's still celebrated. You know, to be a bartender in Italy is still somehow something that you know you can be proud of. You know, especially if you pursue a career out of it. You know, of course, if you work in a random bar in the middle of nowhere. Still has it, it's a random job, but 
if you really pursue your career and you really try to make something out of it, it it's something that is still viewed as, as a very positive thing, you know? Yeah, I got to imagine that must be a huge part of it because I think, I think it's, it's very true in many parts of the world. I mean, here, you know, we both live in Singapore and, you know, for uh, for a lot of the local people here, it's not, it, it, it hasn't really caught on necessarily as far as like sometimes the family support when it comes to it as a career. Mm-hmm. I know for me in the States, like it was a similar thing. Like it was like people were like, oh yeah, but what do you really do? You know what I mean? Uh-huh. So I, I think, I think that. Yeah, I mean, from from the the, the general charisma of of most Italian uh, people I've met, men and men and women, and and to making an acceptable career in your culture, that yeah, that must have a huge part to do with it. And I mean, it's like look how it's flourished, and and look how it's flourished around the world. So you were at American Bar. We've talked about that. You worked with some amazing characters. You you obviously were a huge part in the success as being a, a core member of the team. And I think. It's something very important that everyone needs to realize. If you have an opportunity to work at an amazing bar, it's like what everyone does every day is what's really important. Mm -hmm. You know, I think people see like flyers for guest shifts and they see the awards and they think like, oh, this person and that person. But really, like the experience at the bar day to day is what makes a great bar. Um, So what what did you do after American Bar? Why did you leave? What why was it the right time? Like. So I think um, when you work in such high performance, very busy environments, after a while, you sort of like want to progress. And I think one of the things that, despite, so despite the fact I had the opportunity to do so, I really wanted to work somewhere where I could call the shots. So being a part of a big machine, it, it, it's cool. But, you know, at some point you just sort of want to decide, okay, in which direction is this place going? So at some point I thought, okay, you know what? I need to develop this part of my like professional career. And I don't think that I can do it here at the Savoy because I've been in it for like about, f- when I left, I was there for four years. So I thought I needed something that gives me some external challenges because I thought I was starting to feel a bit trapped in a circle. And I, I thought, I really thought I needed to see something from the outside. And this is when I started considering other places. So the first thing I did was, I had this very good friend of mine called uh, Jeff, Jeff Robinson, who was opening a place for Jason Atherton at the time, who also used to run Blind Pig and many other uh, restaurant bars. They were opening this Japanese themed uh, restaurant in uh, somewhere in East London. And I thought, you know what, this could be the opportunity because I was really attracted to Japan. At that time, I spent about a month in Japan uh, learning how to like sharpen knives, learning more about the culture, traveling around the country. And I thought, you know, I really... I think this fits me. So I got offered a position there uh, with this friend of mine, uh, Jeff, who was the bar manager at the time. I joined him as his assistant. And uh, we really worked on, on the menu, menu development and team development. But the bar was extremely small. So the bar was about 20 seats, tops. And we had our fair share of like good moments, but it just didn't click. Uh, there was something about working in restaurants that just didn't didn't fit me. I think I love food and I love drinks, but I just think that working in a, in a, in a restaurant bar, so a bar that's still part of a restaurant, still somehow traps you into this like food environment where people just mostly come for food. I just didn't think it was my fit. So I thought, okay, you know what? I need some time to reprogram. And so I just took like sort of like a sabbatical six months after that, to which uh, they led me to one of the jobs which I really enjoyed a lot, uh, which was the Blue Bar at the Barclay. So the Barclay is like a, this uh, beautiful, very, very small five-star hotel in Belgravia that has um, this bar, which is like a very, very sexy room. It's called Blue Bar. So the whole idea there was about creating drinks that are very accessible to people. So the main focus of the menu was on accessibility. And uh, we worked very hard on trying to develop a menu that allowed people to choose drinks in less than 30 seconds. But then on top of that, we've also developed something that would uh, eliminate the menu entirely. Now, the first thing that uh, came to mind is places like Attaboy, for instance. They do not have a menu as such, and uh, they rely on human interaction in order for you to have a drink. What we wanted to do was like sort of take it to the next level. So what we ended up doing was opening uh, what is uh, was the smallest bar in the UK at the time. It was a small uh, room, two meters per two meters. We called it Out of the Blue. And it was this multimedia room where we spent about... Uh, quarter of a million pounds to make it uh, an interactive room, meaning that we wanted to give people a specific set of drinks, 
but instead of having them to like either choose a drink or trying to understand the drink, we would try to change the context around it. So with the room, we had the uh, projectors so we could change the surroundings. We could change the smell, so we had different smells pumped in. And we could also change uh, temperature. We could manage every single aspect of the experience and we would use the ingredients as sort of a timeline in order for us to deliver that to guests. So the experience was about 30 minutes and uh, each drink was uh, paired with some uh, curated content. So for instance, you'd sit there, you wouldn't know what you're drinking, right? And the first drink would have certain ingredients, but then we would have visual clues that are pumped in into the room while you're there. For instance, the first thing we had was like this canyon that was made out of pineapples. And then you got the pineapple smell. And then at some point you've got these like very sexy fruits around you, but because it's quite dark, you don't really, you can't really tell what is it. But then we pump in the smell of peach. So, you know, it's peach. Then at some point you're surrounded by grapes, you know, but they're like very zoomed in grapes with this like very, very sexy micro cam, uh, macro cameras, which are super zoomed in. So you can't really tell what is it you are. And it's got this sort of like mystical, like feel to it. And then the more you sip the drink and you smell and you experience, the more you get to understand what is it that you have. Well, that sounds epic. Yeah, it was very <laughs> cool. Yeah, we ran it for about a year out of the blue. The pro- main problem with it is that we had the maximum four covers per session and we had about five sessions a day. It was very, very successful. But yeah, like after a while, like it's difficult to make money out of it if this makes sense yes of course well i mean it's like it almost sounds like this amazing dream of the thing like in that sense yeah um but i'm sure that was that was an amazing experience i think many bartenders out in the world would love to be able to have like that full encapsulating thing and i'm sure the logistics behind it must have been crazy it it was so cool we had to find a glass that would allow us because we wanted to serve the drinks all at the same time and to have people have them in chronological orders Mm. So what we ended up finding was this ceramic double walled glass that was perfect for retaining temperature. So we had a temperature of like a temperature drop of less than five degrees over the space of 30 minutes. Uh, so we had to do a lot of testing about the glasses. We found this um, steel balls found uh, filled with like, like freezing gel. So we could keep the temperature of the drinks lower for other drinks. So we had a literally 0% drop in temperature after 25 minutes so when people arrived to drink number three it was supposed to be a minus seven degrees martini what they get is a minus seven degrees martini and it's been sitting in front of them for like 30 minutes it was super cool respect yeah. you guys doing any pop-up soon i'd like to yeah that'd be cool <laughs> yeah that, that was such a cool experience yeah awesome man so um from the berkeley where it sounds like so so you leave american bar uh, you do the Japanese thing for a little bit. It wasn't quite a fit because it was a little more mm-hmm. restaurant forward. You go to the Berkeley, you get to do this uh, really, really like full sensory Super type cool, thing, yeah. which is cool because I think I feel like that's something that still hasn't really been fully realized yet is, is the way that some fine dining three star Michelin restaurants are able to really encapsulate the entire experience. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like, I mean, you have the aviary in Chicago and New York now, but there's not a whole lot of bars that really have been able to do that. And I don't like finding the audience. I'm sure is a challenge as well. Um, but so, so how did you, how did you end up in Singapore? How'd, how'd you go from Berkeley to moving a 12 hour long flight to Southeast Asia? That's crazy. I had this very good friend of mine. Uh, his name is uh, Joe Schofield. So he moved here to Singapore, uh, worked in Tipling club and he brought his spouse with him, uh, Mimi Schofield. She worked for Proof. Proof is a uh, distributing company here in uh, Singapore. And they occasionally do consultancy programs uh, for certain places. And uh, they had this opportunity to work for Mandarin Oriental here. And um, after having a bit of a chit chat with Mimi, she thought I was a good fit for this specific job. And she said, you know, why don't you try it? When the opportunity came, I, it was my ninth year in London. So I thought, you know, like uh, perhaps I need to see something different. And I eventually decided, you know, like I was 29 at the time. I, I really like Asia. I think I need to find a place that allows me to experience it before it's too late and I want to settle down and have a family and all this sort of thing. So I ended up, um, yeah, I ended up going for the interviews. I loved the position. I loved what the hotel was about to do. So I just I went into it. So here, here again, this is 10 years later, right? Yeah, like and now, later. now you're doing it again. You're, yeah. you're, you're jumping, you're taking that leap. Uh, do you miss London? You know, I miss parts of London. Uh, there are other parts that I don't miss. For instance, I I, I don't miss the, the the rental situation in London. 
where you get to live in like a, a, a shoebox for like a trillion pounds a month. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and sometimes London can be a bit overwhelming, very busy, you know, very difficult to, to, the logistics of London can be quite difficult. So moving from point A to point B can be sometimes quite a bit of a challenge. Um, but the things that I miss about London is the glamour. It's, it's the, the well-established bar scene and, you know, how homey it all feels. I don't know. Like I, I, London has shaped me a lot. Like a lot of what I am right now happened in London, you know, like as a, my adult, I spent the majority of my adult life there. So like a huge part of me was shaped by London. So it wouldn't be fair for me to say I don't miss it. In, in fact, there are parts of it I really, really enjoy. Do you miss the tube? No, I don't miss the tube. <laughs> Not a single bit. As a matter of fact, we were so lucky that me and Marlies, like my, my girlfriend, we managed to find a flat that would allow me to walk to work because otherwise I would be, I'd probably be, I'd be hating London by now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, living in very intense cities like that, like it, it definitely, it, it's almost like there's this, uh, it's almost intangible, but there's like an energy uh, that just pulls yeah. from you, you know, constantly. So, you know, now that you're living here out, out in Southeast Asia and in Singapore and, and running uh, Mobar at the Mandar- Mandarin Oriental, like, tell me a little bit about your thoughts on the difference. It doesn't have to be positive or negative, but about like the cocktail scene you know, bartending in Singapore compared to the cocktail scene and bartending in London? So one of the first things I noticed here is that the pool of guests is much smaller than the pool of guests that you've got in other places, like other big cities, to to mention your Londons and New Yorks. So the percentage of people who really enjoy a cocktail, it's it's about, I'd say, it's much smaller than what you would find in a much more developed market. And this creates a whole host of like challenges for you. But on the other hand, it also creates a whole lot of opportunities for you because there aren't that many cocktail bars here in Singapore. I mean, now we're starting to have more and more, but like, say, if you compare it to other developed markets, like, you know, your New York, like you have a bazillion cocktail bars out out there. And so what you need to ask yourself is like, how do I create something that stands out in this crowd? While in Singapore, you still have somehow the same issue, sort of speak but it's much more contained, you know? So it is easier for you to make a mark in that regard, but also allows you a bit more personal space. Like I remember working in in London and and having a queue outside my bar on a Tuesday evening, and that does not happen here. You know, I do not have the sort of gigantic money-making machine behind me that is constantly needs me to be part of it. Otherwise it does not function right here because you've got this like, little bit more of a pattern that allows you to have these days where you're not too busy and days where you're actually very busy, you know, it kind of allows you to focus on other projects. So there are parts of it I I really, really like. Plus Singapore is super central, you know, it's so easy to travel Asia from here. It's surreal. All right. So you got Singapore and you got London. One thing you love about both cities, one thing you could uh, do without. Well, you mentioned about London, you mentioned the tube. I could, totally do without it like i mean i need to sort that thing out somehow i don't know but it's true i've been there like two months ago and you're like squeezed like a sardine in the train yeah, I'm like, I know. why the hell am i doing this to myself man i had that same yeah. experience when we were both out there i was like whoa i'm not familiar with this <laughs> yeah, anymore yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i love i love uh, and what i love about london is the quintessential uh i think what london is is the quintessential european city You've got a representation, strong representation of every single country in Europe. And you can find any cuisine you want in Europe. And it's just taken to such an, an enormous extent. It's unbelievable. And then about Singapore, what I really like about Singapore is that it's such an easy city to live in. They make it so easy for you to move over and everything is so silky smooth. And like if I think about my transition from Italy to London and the transition from London to Singapore is like night and day. What I want, uh, what I wish Singapore had more was a bit more of a drink culture. So I like, I, I would love Singapore to be in a bit more of a developed state in terms of like drinking culture, you know, like, so you wouldn't have to get to the stage where you get guests to like, you have to walk guests to a certain point in order for you to deliver something that perhaps you love. Because w- what I love about London as well is that you got people who walk in and they already know, okay, cool. I'm having a 50-50 Sazerac, right? You don't get that here, you know? 
Yeah, I mean, a hundred percent. I mean, you know, I mean, Singapore is also such a young country, right? It is, it is. It is. So it's only in, the, in its fifties mm-hmm. right now as a country, and so, you know, you're you're very much at the forefront of creating the culture of what drinking and cultures, uh, or what the drinking culture will be here and going forward. So, we're we're almost kind of at the the present day, if you will. So you know, you've you've been in Singapore for a little over a year, if I'm yeah, correct. Yeah, about a year and, and a bit. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So what's what, what's going on in Mobar? What's what's next for Michele and 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 the world of cocktails and your journey and what are you thinking? So at the moment we're in the process of launching our new cocktail menu. Uh, we've been working on it for about a year. So the venue itself is inspired by the nomadic tribes that inhabit Southeast Asia. So this gives us a lot of flexibility about what is it that we want to do. Of course, there are some certain hot uh, topics nowadays. Uh, that we needed to keep into consideration when designing the menu. Uh, you know, sustainability being a big one, for instance. Uh, so we wanted to create something that was quite unique and quite innovative. Our next iteration of the menu, we've been working on it for a year, and it's the culmination of a program that we call Nomadic Foragers. So for the past 12 months, uh, myself and the team have been traveling around uh, Southeast Asia, and we have been partnering in 16 different destinations with uh, different bars, producers, farmers, whatever we could find or we found interesting. And then we would go for like a foraging session where we could find some ingredients that we like to work with. And then we would eventually bring them back to Singapore. Uh, our next menu will feature 16 uh, different collaborators that helped us to achieve that. Uh, we will also have a drink which will be Singapore-based, which was born out of the cooperation with Native. Uh, VJ is a very, very cool guy. And uh, so that that's taking the lion's share of our uh, focus at the moment. So we're really looking forward to be launching this menu towards um, December. And yeah, like what we managed to do was not only to find and discover ingredients in other countries, but we also had to think about the logistics, about avoiding importing ingredients from other countries because we wanted to reduce the carbon footprint of our bar. So we managed to partner with some indoor farms here in Singapore to regrow some of the herbs that we find in other places. Uh, We managed to source them with uh, different seeds that we managed to bring back, uh, half legally, half not. And Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so um, we're really looking forward to that. Uh, We will have a lot of emphasis on accessibility. Again, I think it's something that is very important. So the wording for our menu will be quite minimalistic, meaning that if a drink tastes like caramel, whiskey, and cream, it will say caramel, whiskey, and cream. Then if we went uh, to the Himalayas to source the sugar for that specific caramel drink, that does not matter to your experience, ultimately. If you want to know more about it, we can tell you. But like we are trying to get this sort of accessible plan. To give you an example, for instance, one of the drinks that we will have on our menu will be designed around uh, some of our colleagues which come from the Philippines. So a big tradition in the Philippines for expats when they come back is to bring whiskey and chocolates back. So we decided to create a drink around that specific idea. We have a a huge percentage of our team is made out of Filipinos. And uh, the drink on our menu will simply state that it's made out of whiskey and chocolate. While the reality is that we've been partnering with different chocolate farms in the region of Davao, which is in the south of the Philippines, to select a specific chocolate blend that we like. And then we get that in. And then we pair that with different ingredients in order to make sure that we really extract the flavor they want out of this chocolate. Wow. I mean, that sounds awesome and involved. You just made me feel lazy about the, <laughs> the menus I've been working on with my team. Um, well, I cannot wait to come and come and try that in December, which is very close. Very, so very close. pressure's on, I suppose. Woo. Well, I think it's only fair that I have to ask you probably the most important question of the podcast. And here you are, and you're on an island, literally, but also figuratively, and you're strapped into an electric chair oh, Okay. on the island. <laughs> what is your final cocktail, Michaela? The final cocktail? So, I'm a bittersweet guy, so I think it'll have to be something bittersweet. You know, like, I had a very cool answer the other day. Like, a guy, I, I will be releasing the, the, the episode quite shortly. But this guy said to me, like, the drink I will have is a corpse survivor, so then it can come back to life. <laughs> I mean, that is, that's strong. That's very, very strong. Still wouldn't be my last drink, but fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> very much so, yeah. But uh, I think the drink that I will have is, it must be something like a Negroni or like an Americano. Americano is actually the first drink I've ever mixed myself, so I think I'll be an Americano. I love Americano. Oh, okay. so, yeah. so you want to, like, ride off into the sunset, like, light and refreshed with some Yeah, exactly, you know, like, yeah. sunset's coming, like, my end is near. <laughs> 
That's it. I have an Americano. Well, I think the end is also near to this podcast, Michaela, and um, that was awesome. Great to hear your story. I mean, it's certainly inspiring and and really cool to see someone who's gone through this journey of like taking risks, jumping, putting yourself in situations that are unfamiliar and learning and growing through that. And I think really that is the best way to progress and the best way to grow. So thank you so much for your time on thank your you own podcast. Your <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it, Michaela. Cheers. Thank you, Jesse. We hope you enjoyed our interview with McKelly. We are undigged underscore media on Instagram, and you can follow our personal accounts at mmariotti89 for McKelly, Alex J. Murphy for myself, and Adrian Bessa for Adrian. Thank you for listening.